Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much uh, for, first of all, that introduction. Uh, you should travel with me because you didn't bring up any of the controversies. But uh, let, let me first say for people that don't know or don't uh, or know little, I, I started uh, very young. Uh, I, was a, I was born in Brooklyn, New York, and I was raised in the church. And I started preaching when I was very young. I felt the, what we would call in the church, the calling uh, or the passion to preach. And in the uh, Pentecostal church that I grew up, it was allowed, rare, but allowed, that they would let kids preach. And I preached my first sermon when I was four years old. Uh, they had to stand me on a, a box so that people could see me. So I literally grew up preaching. Uh, because of uh, that, I got to meet uh, a lot of the gospel greats. And by the time I was 11 or 12 years old, I had a real uh, compulsion to deal with what was going on in the broader society. Uh, now you can imagine, all that sounds crazy, but if you are you know, five, six, seven, eight years old preaching, you already are different than other kids. So I didn't hang out a lot. I was a loner because most of my friends, their parents came to hear me preach, so they were not conducive to me being one of the hangout boys. Once I became older, like 11, 12-ish, you can imagine trying to get a date with a girl when you're a preacher, you know, you can't uh, say fresh things, you're a minister, and my mom comes and hear you. So it was an awkward childhood, though it was the only childhood I knew, because uh, it was me. So I got interested, very passionate about uh, the uh, social scene. It was the height of the civil rights movement, and uh, Martin Luther King was in the South, Malcolm X was uh, in New York, uh, where I was, and the congressman in Harlem was a minister, Adam Clayton Powell. So I was mesmerized by Adam Clayton Powell. And I went, met him. He knew who I was as a boy preacher. And I grew uh, into wanting to be socially involved. Uh, when I became, when I was 12 years old, I, uh, my bishop, who was totally against uh, political and social involvement, had a conference with my mother, and uh, they said, uh, what are we going to do? We don't want him getting out there with the militants, the violent crowd. If he's going to be involved in civil rights, at least make him stay in the church. So they took me to a guy named Reverend William Jones, who uh, was the head of Dr. King's organization in New York. And Dr. Jones said, I'll take him under my wing. We'll keep him in the nonviolent movement and in the church. And he introduced me to a guy who became my mentor until now, uh, though he still thinks I'm 12, but I'm not. Uh, and his name is Reverend Jesse Jackson. And I became his youth director. He was 13 or 14 years older than me. That year, Dr. King got killed. And uh, I'd been involved in the movement uh, around human rights and civil rights ever since. Uh, in fact, a uh, week after next, two weeks from now, uh, it will be my birthday, and uh, I will be 63, and I will have been involved as an official in civil rights for 50 years. So one of the students walked over to me and says, I've been following you for years, but you know I'm not that old, so it's only a few years. I, I told him, I was almost embarrassed to ask him. I only mentioned my birthday because my daughter is my girlfriend, her daughter, everybody's here, and I'm just reminding them. <laughs> There's a lot of places you could shop in Dublin before we go back and surprise me on my birthday. But anyway, before we get to the question, so as I look at the world today, and I have fought around racial uh, and uh, xenophobic and uh, Islamophobia for a long time, I see that we are in as much peril now 
as we were when I was a kid joining Dr. King. Uh, this present president that we have in the United States, Donald Trump, I've known Donald Trump maybe 40 years. I first uh, got to know him because he was trying to build uh, his casinos in Atlantic City and he wanted uh, black fighters and black uh, entertainers to perform there. And many of them were supportive of me. The reason my youth movement when I was younger and later Nash Action Network was able to make it initially was uh, I met entertainers that uh, liked what I was doing. One kind of took me as a son uh, known as James Brown, the godfather. So James Brown took me as a son and James Brown uh, helped subsidize me. Through James, I met Michael Jackson and Michael and I were very close. So they helped raise money or give money to my organization. James Brown and Michael and Mike Tyson, who grew up in Brooklyn where I were, were the A-list artist boxers of that time. Trump needed to do business with them. So he would act cool with us. He'd go to our events, go to our fairs, support the Democrats for office. Then in 1990, there was a vicious uh, and despicable rape in the Central Park of Brooklyn, I mean of Manhattan, I'm sorry. And they accused, they just rounded up and they accused five young black and Latino uh, boys of raping this white female, almost killing her. We thought the act was vicious, but we felt the evidence didn't fit that these young boys did it. And one of the grandmothers called me and, and by then I was known because I'd been leading marches and doing things on my, uh, in my own and said, my, my, my grandson is not guilty. So I took the case and started fighting it. Donald Trump, who was a builder, real estate guy, and was acting like he was cool with us, took out full page ads in the five or four or five newspapers in New York saying these guys should be given the death penalty. They should be executed. So I marched on Donald Trump. And uh, then a few years later, he went back Democrat back and forward, back and forward. Donald Trump, in my opinion, is not uh, one that is a firm believer in anything other than Donald Trump. <laughs> he will go whichever way that suits him, which to me is dangerous. Reporters ask me all the time, do I think he's a racist? And my answer is it doesn't matter. I don't know if he goes to bed at night hating blacks, hating uh, Muslims or not. I know what he's doing is to the detriment of blacks and the detriment of Muslims. And he's playing and knowingly playing to a racist crowd, which is almost even worse. This last thing over the weekend, I want you to uh, uh, watch this very carefully and then I know we're going into Q&A, but never give a preacher the microphone because we don't know when to stop. <laughs> NFL players, one started named Colin Kaepernick, got on his knee to raise attention to police brutality and racism in the country. That was the point. Now there's a history to this. Five years ago, young black boy is, is uh, teenagers killed in Florida and uh, Really, what, none of us really knew that much about it. His parents got in touch with me. We went down, called a rally. We brought 10,000 people in, helped blow it up. His name was Trayvon Martin. It's five years ago. After we made it nationally known, basketball players started wearing T-shirts for Trayvon. LeBron James, who was then playing uh, in Miami. Uh, Dwayne Wade. Then... We went from there two, uh, three years later, policemen choked to death a young man named Eric Garner in New York, whose case we still handle uh, with National Action Network, my civil rights group. And he said on videotape, they videotaped this policeman choking to death. 11 times he said, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. LeBron and them went on basketball court with I can't breathe t-shirt. So what Colin Kaepernick did was the last expression, most recent expression 
of athletes in this era getting involved. When I was a kid, Muhammad Ali uh, refused to go to the war. I mean, this is not new. The reason I raise it is no president from Ali to LeBron ever came out as this president did over the weekend and told people that they should protest the protesters. Now, he's very shrewdly trying to shift the issue from what they're protesting about to, well, they're disrespecting the flag. No, they're not disrespecting the flag. They're asking the flag to stand up to what the flag's supposed to represent. If they would, they're not burning the flag. They're not defacing the flag. They're saying that while you pledge to the flag, a flag that the pledge that they made me say as a little boy, that stands for freedom and justice for all, that you need to live up to that. That's what they're saying. In a nonviolent, quiet way. What is more peaceful than to kneel down like you're getting ready to pray? This president, who has not found it in his vocabulary to say even the most slightly disparaging thing about Vladimir Putin, not even slightly, not even that he's not six feet tall. <laughs> he comes out over the weekend and says, these son of a bitches. So you disagree with the protests and you go call them mother's bitches? Do you know the difficulty it is for black women to raise their kids sometime in deprived areas and keep them out of trouble? and keep them on the right path, and they become professional athletes, and now the President of the United States is gonna call you a bitch? This is why you saw the reaction yesterday of a lot of athletes, because now it's like, wait a minute. This is the President of the United States. Then he turns around and says to the NFL owners, and fire them. Now, it is also a real, game of distraction because he doesn't own an NFL team. He does not have power over NFL owners, but he runs the United States government. So rather than him address the issues they're kneeling about, police brutality, police reform, racial injustice, we're still twice more unemployed uh, black to white in the, in the United States. We still have the worst educational facilities. So rather than he addressing why he stopped the Obama reforms on policing, why his Justice Department pulled out of protecting voting rights, why he has an education secretary that's reneging on a lot of uh, public funds. He goes to the distraction of fire them if they protest. Wait a minute, why don't you address what you have power over? You don't have power over the NFL. You have power over the government. And it is a major distraction. And it is cynical. First of all, can you imagine somebody that for five years ran around protesting saying that Barack Obama was not an American, that he was born in Kenya, not born in the, in the United States, and, and went through all of this okie doke con game. I'm going to send detectives to Hawaii to look for the birth certificate. Oh, here's a long I mean, just, I mean, this is games people played in the hood when I was growing up. Look at this. Don't look at that. And he went on fight. That was his political capital. But now people can't get on their knees and pray during the Pledge of Allegiance. This is a three card Monty game. If you ever visit New York, they have this con game they do in Times Square where they put three cards or five cards, they put it out, tourists come, and they say, put your money under one of the cards. And if you can guess what card your money's under, you can win the whole bundle. And the whole idea is, is the moving of the eye. Put under one card, they flip it, flip it, flip it, and you dress the wrong card, they beat you $20. And that's what he's playing. He's playing three card mining game. We're not gonna talk about policing. We're not talking about racial inequality in education. Uh, we're gonna talk about the flag. Nobody's talking about the flag. They're saying during the pledge, live up to what the flag is about. And I think that this is absolutely him playing to a race crowd. He went to Huntsville, Alabama and said it. 
Now he comes out with a new travel ban list, another nation that's majority Muslim. Everything he's done, he's played to divisiveness, to misogyny. I might add calling them women a bitch is misogynistic. To call women misogynist names is an absolute insult to everyone. And I fear that he, playing this divisive game, will cause a lot of disrepair in this country and around the world. And the challenge is, uh, for us is to get through him and really hold the Congress and to make sure these policies are not enacted and that we can bring about justice and fairness. I think that Barack Obama did a lot of good. We could have done a lot more if he didn't face obstruction. But the things he did get through, I think that uh, Donald Trump is trying to erase. So I know that there are challenges here. I've come to England in March for Roland Adams many years ago. I've worked with Operation Black Vote. I've, I know that some of the issues uh, in, in terms of Ireland, which I promise I'm going to try to get out of here and not say anything that will get me stopped at customs from leaving, <laughs> getting in your business. But I've watched a lot of the challenges here. And I think all over the world, we are still dealing with the issues of race, of class, of gender, of our respecting other people, whether they're LGBTQ, and respecting other people's religion. And we've got to come to terms with it. And it's not a question of, uh, are we still going to deal with it? We're going to deal with it until we solve it. There's no timeline on it. There is a destination for us. Thank you.